we thought this would be kind of the safest way to go about doing things. But we are available by phone or email if you do want to have any one-on-one -on -one conversations about anything that's in the plan. Um, and, you know, hopefully in with not being able to do it in person, this is a, a decent substitute. Um, so tonight we're here to talk about the Sunset Bay Aquatic Plant Management Plan or the draft version of it. Um, my name is Corinne Deering. I'm the Winnebago Waterways Program Director for Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. And I'll be giving the majority of the presentation tonight. Um, on the line is Emily Henry Gillis. And um, Emily, hi. Has, hi, Emily. Um, Emily has been, you know, a super big, important part of this whole development process. Um, tonight, she's helping out with kind of moderating, trying to keep me on time because I have a tendency to kind of trail off on stuff. Um, and also be able to answer any questions through chat. So if you haven't used GoToMeeting before, there is a little chat bubble. And if you click on that, you can send um, Emily questions or comments. And then when we stop for a Q&A session, if it's something that isn't a quick response that Emily can give, um, we'll make sure to bring that up during one of the, the question and answer um, kind of slots that we have throughout the presentation. Is there anyone on the phone? Oh, that's a good question. Do we have anyone that's just on the phone tonight and not um, able to view the screens? Okay. All right, so we'll keep um, chugging along here. So our agenda tonight's really simple, although we have a lot to cover. We're just gonna walk through kind of the background of how the development of the plan came about. We're gonna walk through baseline information about aquatic plants and water quality. Um, and then we're gonna walk through the Sunset Bay Action Plan. So really kind of the purpose of why this plan was put together. Um, just some housekeeping stuff. Again, you know, just be respectful and, and constructive. Um, we are completely 100% okay if you disagree with us on things. We just ask that um, we be respectful about those disagreements. We also ask that you keep your microphones muted unless you're talking, and that just helps to um, prevent, you know, feedback and weird noises and people talking over each other. Um, a reminder that the presentation is being recorded and that Emily is gonna be moderating. And one last reminder that the um, public comment period will be closing on February 7th. Um, after that, we'll, we will be kind of incorporating all the comments and suggestions that we've received, revising the plan and sending it for final review to the DNR. Okay, so before I dive into background stuff, does anyone have any questions about kind of introductions or housekeeping or what we've gone over so far? Okay, awesome. Um, has everyone been able to locate the chat icon? I guess should I say, I should ask, has anyone not been able to find the chat icon? Okay. All right, so the background information of how did we get here? Um, some of you might be familiar with this, but just in case, we thought we'd go through it. So in 2019, a group of property owners in Sunset Bay began working together to address nuisance growth of aquatic plants, aquatic invasive species, thinking about how to balance those things with habitat protection, and then also, um, you know, trying to figure out how to address some water quality concerns. Um, this aquatic plant, so there, there are plans that are, were developed for the larger lake system, um, but the, those were really developed at a larger scale. And so this aquatic plant management plan is really intended to serve as a strategy for local management of Sunset Bay so that the people who live around the bay 
have um, have the decision making power rather than be a kind of a system wide um, a system wide process. So property owners at the time raised over five thousand dollars and committed volunteer time to get a plan developed. Our organization um, more than doubled that commitment with our program funds and um, worked with those property owners to get to this point of having a draft aquatic plant management plan. Oh, look at that. My header decided to come in. Um, so this is a little bit out of order, but I, I think that the answers we received to um, a question in the 2020 survey um, really shows kind of that the, the property owners that initiated this process were on the right track and had correctly identified what a lot of their fellow property owners also had concerns about. Um, and so just looking at this, people who responded to the survey said that blue-green algae blooms excessive aquatic plant growth, aquatic invasive species, um, and water quality, as well as filamentous algae blooms for really kind of the top issues that they that they were concerned about um, and that seemed to be kind of shared with the people who initiated the planning process. So when I talk about the planning process, um, I just wanted to kind of walk through and say that you know it, it started out with the property owners identifying the problem and then organizing. And so they talked to their neighbors to figure out who else is interested in you know, addressing these problems. Um, from there, they engaged the um, you know, additional property owners around Sunset Bay and other stakeholders. Oh. This here should read 2019. Make a note about that typo. Um, so they engage through public meetings and, and other um, avenues, collected public input through, um, you know, collecting in-person comments from folks during meetings and then also by completing a, um, a pre-planning survey. And then from there, volunteered to gather data, water quality data, documenting conditions and things like that. Um, and now we're kind of at that last step of reviewing the plan, um, approving and, and getting it finalized. So this really is kind of the home stretch that we're on. Um, so the next steps is part of this phase six is to um, collect that public comment, review and revise and send to the DNR for final approval. Okay, so I, I did lie earlier. Here is one more reminder about the um, closure of the public comment period. So please, please get us your comments by February 7th. Um, it's really important to us that this plan, when it's finalized, does reflect the desires and interests of the property owners around Sunset Bay. Okay, any questions about that quick background? Okay. So we're gonna jump right into baseline information. Um, so what do we know? A real quick summary. Um, Lake Butamore is impaired, so as a result, Sunset Bay is also impaired. Um, Sunset Bay is 611 acres out of 8,500 acres um, in the larger lake. It's home to some of the best aquatic habitat in the entire lake system. So uh, when I say lake system, I'm talking about 159,000 acres of surface water. And we know that the bay suffers from filamentous and blue-green algae blooms, aquatic invasive species, um, poor water circulation in some areas, and some limited recreation due to nuisance vegetation. 
So when I'm talking about Sunset Bay, um, if we put it in perspective, looking at the state of Wisconsin, it's this tiny red dot here. And then as we zoom in closer, we see the four Winnebago pool lakes um, and we have Sunset Bay in the red square. And if we zoom in a little further, we see where Sunset Bay is situated in Lake Butamore. Um, this map here is kind of as close as we can get while still looking at the entire um, Sunset Bay. Emily, is my are my slides getting cut off on the bottom? Um, I see a blue line, so possibly. No, I zoomed out fine. a little bit. I don't think so. Yeah. You might are you zoomed in maybe on your slides? I don't know. It's this weird line, right? I don't think so. I think you're okay. Okay. Let me know if it gets weird on any of them. Because I definitely try to maximize the space on some of the slides. So the Winnebago Lakes, over 500 or over 159,000 acres. Lake Butamore, um, almost 9,000 acres, and Sunset Bay is 611 acres. Um, Lake Butamore has 53 miles of shoreline, and Sunset Bay has about three and a half miles of shoreline. And what's interesting is, while Sunset Bay, when you compare it to Lake Butamore, seems really small, um, so the bay itself is actually the size of a lot of um, Wisconsin lakes. And so this this kind of comprehensive plan, having a site-specific plan, um, is going to be pretty comparable to what you would find for um, your average Wisconsin lake. So when we um, did an aquatic plant survey, we also took kind of approximate depths. And this map here is um, an interpolation of the those depths that we recorded. Um, so that's how we kind of came to that average of, of five feet across Sunset Bay. Um, so it's it's really those are rough kind of rough estimates based on the areas that we were able to access during the, the survey, um, you know, as well as just the the room for error with an interpolation. Okay, so um, so part of the baseline data was collecting input from stakeholders. So the, the purpose of the 2020 um, pre-planning survey was to gain a better understanding of the current levels of awareness that stakeholders had about different issues and how stakeholders felt about potential management options. So it's really important to know when developing a comprehensive plan like this, um, you know, if lake users agree that management of nuisance plants is needed um, to have a to know kind of how people are using the bay, where they're using the bay, so which which parts of the bay are they using for what, um, and the types of management options people are comfortable with. So this was really used if you if you've read through the report, um, the survey is kind of broken down throughout the report to talk about how people felt about different things based on their responses um, and was was a basis for informing a lot of the recommendations that that came out at the end. So um, about 98 percent of respondents. So the the survey went out to um, we invited about, I think, 144 properties, plus we left it open to people that didn't live in the Bay who were just considered stakeholders. Um, we received 53 responses, and so that response rate is, um, is actually pretty good for this type of survey. Of those respondents, 98% own property in Sunset Bay, 73% are year-round residents, and 67% of property owners who have owned their property um, have owned their property for more than 10 years. 
And so we have a lot of residents that have been here for a little while. Um, 48 of the 53 respondents live in Sunset Bay. Um, two respondents own Lake Bottom or channel property. And so um, I, oh, I didn't include it in this presentation, but if you look in the plan, there's a map that shows um, kind of the, the tax parcel outlines. And it's not uncommon throughout the Winnebago system to see um, chunks of Lake Bottom that are still privately owned. And that's the case with Sunset Bay because that used to be land. Um, and then we had two respondents who were other stakeholders out that, that don't live in Sunset Bay, but use Sunset Bay for um, different reasons. The other thing we did was in the survey, we asked people to identify their approximate location if they are a property owner in Sunset Bay. Um, and this really helped us to determine if we were seeing, you know, kind of some spatial relationships among um, responses. So most of our respond responses came from um, the areas A, B, E, and G, um, and we'll kind of see kind of how that plays out. So just a couple other summaries from the, the stakeholder survey. Um, activities most enjoyed by users are, it's kind of a mix of silent sports and power boating, and the number one was really relaxing and entertaining. Nature viewing and boating came second. Um, swimming, was third and fourth was canoeing or kayaking. So that nature viewing and kind of power boating were um, tied for that number two spot. Again, the top factors, I think we talked about this, were green algae blooms, excessive aquatic plant growth, um, aquatic invasive species, and water quality degradation. Then when we look at the reasons why um, people own their property in Sunset Bay, um, you can just kind of see the rest of the breakdown here with this, with this chart. So while recreational opportunities are, um, you know, really diverse, that can cause a little bit of issues in, in, in introducing complexity when wanting to manage the bay for aquatic plants, habitat, and water quality, because we, you start to see some kind of conflicting uh, interests in how the bay should be managed. Um, a couple other interesting things to note is that 94% of respondents use some type of watercraft in Sunset Bay, whether it's motorized or non-motorized. And 82% um, of those respondents do use motorized vessels at some point throughout the year. So we have a lot of people who enjoy um, motorized boating and a lot of people who also enjoy some of those silent sports or non-motorized watercraft. So thinking about recreation in Sunset Bay, um, there are four main ways that the public can access Sunset Bay. So aside from people accessing from their own property who live there, um, people can get there by boat from larger Lake Butamore. Um, they can visit the Shangri-La Point Nature Preserve, which is kind of shown in that greenish blue color. Um, the Wyawash Trail is a very popular trail that kind of runs alongside part of the bay. Um, it's another way. And then using the small boat launch located along the shoreline of, um, of Sunset Bay. So we know that recreation is kind of one of the big um, reasons why a lot of people own property in Sunset Bay. Um, so we're just going to, that's why we're kind of spending a little bit of time on it. Another reason, um, another type of recreation is fishing. And Lake Butamore is known to have a world-class fishery um, along with, you know, most of the Winnebago system. That fishery supports extensive tourism, um, bolsters the region's strong fishing culture, and contributes to the regional economy. So fishing, recreational fishing, brings a lot of money into a five-county region around um, 
the Winnebago system. There are several popular fish species, um, you know, walleye, your panfish, um, bass, pike, that kind of thing. And Sunset Bay is really popular year round for fishing because of the abundant and diverse aquatic plant community that really provides high quality habitat. Um, so it's a well known area by a lot of um, anglers who, who frequent the Winnebago lakes. Approximately 67% of survey respondents um, reported that they fish in Sunset Bay. And of those who fish, 57% have been doing so for more than 10 years. So again, we do have some longevity in the, um, the people who are frequenting or live around Sunset Bay. As many of you know um, that are on this call, recreation is impacted by water quality. And people who live on the lake tend to um, be more directly affected than the average lake user. When a blue-green algae bloom shows up in a lake, if you live there, it's happening in your backyard. Um, the low water clarity, frequent algae blooms, the whether it's blue-green or filamentous, can um, really impact your shoreland property values as well as impact your, your direct use of it. There's also health concerns for you know, kids or pets, um, people worrying about them being exposed to toxins caused by blue-green algae blooms. And then there's the impact to the aesthetic enjoyment. Um, and so that your enjoyment of your property as well as your property value could be diminished with that poor water quality. So that brings us to the water quality perception. So impacts from water quality um, have not been experienced equally across the bay. So um, the survey asked, you know, how would you describe current water quality? And this was kind of the breakdown of responses. So most people, um, I guess the most popular choice was poor water quality, followed by fair and then good and then and very poor. Um, very few people selected excellent as as water quality, and so I think you know overall the water quality perception um, is kind of on target with what we see for water in in results from water quality monitoring. But when we look at it spatially, and so when we break it down by where people have reported that they um, that they live in Sunset Bay, we definitely see some differences. Um, where your your northern part of the bay is seeing worse water quality um, than the southern and eastern parts. Does this surprise anybody? This breakdown. All right. I'll take that as a doesn't moment. surprise me. No. <laughs> um. Hang on um, one second, you guys. I just got a message. Um, hey, Emily, I had someone just message me. I'm going to forward that to you because they were trying to get on the call. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I don't even know how to do this. Emily, I'm just going to send you um, the their phone number. Okay. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay. So then um, we go from kind of what people think about the current water quality conditions, and then we look at the perceived changes in water quality over time. Um, and here we see that most people are saying that water quality has gotten at least somewhat worse. Um, and again, you know, a similar kind of spatial pattern with um, Area E kind of jumping in saying that they've seen some degradation in water quality. 
where um, GNF are re reported that it's kind of stayed the same. So what do we actually see for water quality in the, the measured monitoring? Well, Sunset Bay, as I mentioned earlier, is listed as, as impaired, and that's because it's part of Lake Butamore. Um, Lake Butamore is listed on the EPA 303D impairment list, which is basically a list of water, of water bodies that are not meeting certain um, criteria for designated uses. And that means that they're they're not meeting criteria to support aquatic life, to support recreation, or to support public health and welfare. So if we look at what Lake Butamore is impaired for, we see that for um, total phosphorus and chlorophyll A. So that chlorophyll A is a um, a number that's used to kind of represent um, the blue green algae concentrations. We're seeing for recreation that the lake is exceeding criteria, so it's not attaining the recreational use because it's exceeding criteria for total phosphorus and chlorophyll. Um, public health and welfare, we don't see any problems with attaining, so that's good news. And then for aquatic life, we're seeing that the lake is exceeding criteria for phosphorus, chlorophyll, and suspended solids. Um, and so it's not where it needs to be in order to support aquatic life based on numeric criteria. So we talk about water quality. Um, phosphorus is a pollutant that is a major driver of blue-green algae blooms. And phosphorus pollution comes from two sources, external sources and internal sources. Um, those external sources are non-point source, um, so surface water runoff that carries phosphorus to the lakes, and then point sources, which are identi identifiable sources um, like a wastewater discharge pipe that goes you know, right into the water. Internal sources are um, resuspended phosphorus-laden sediment, and so our lakes have collected phosphorus in the lake bottom for over 150 years. And that kind of builds up and some of that gets dis, um, disturbed through wind and wave action and resuspended into the water column. There's also uh, to a much smaller degree direct release of dissolved phosphorus from lake sediment through um, different processes such as diffusion, but we won't get into that. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, you know, where phosphorus pollution is coming from because a lot of this is being addressed in those larger watershed scale plans. And as those plans are implemented, um, these phosphorus sources are being addressed, whether it's through agricultural conservation and um, installation of best management practices in, on agricultural land or with point sources reducing their phosphorus pollution through new permitting criteria over the next five to 10 years. Um, so we will see improvements with that and with internal sources as the phosphorus of the external sources start to um, go down, we'll see improved water clarity and that will encourage aquatic plant growth in more areas of the lakes which will stabilize sediments and attenuate that wave energy um, to reduce the, the phosphorus um, in the sediment from being disturbed and, and resuspended. What I did want to highlight is in the plan, it, it talks about um, where this phosphorus pollution is coming from in the watershed. And what I don't think a lot of people know until um, they see a map like this is just the um, the, the size or the area of land that water runs off of before it gets to um, Lake Butamore. And so if we look at all this orange area and all this green area on the map, and of course, some of this bypasses Lake Butamore, but for the sake of this presentation, I mean, we're looking at almost um, 6,000 square miles of land, which is a huge drainage area. Um, and so a lot of that water is kind of passing in front of your homes that um, 
if you live on Sunset Bay. So there's a lot of a lot of opportunity for that surface water runoff to you know pick up those pollutants um, and the efforts that are ongoing to address that are on a 20 year time frame where we really want to see reductions in phosphorus pollution from the land within 20 years to try to get to where we need to be to start meeting some of the in lake water quality criteria for aquatic life and recreational uses. More directly, um, so we have this large drainage basin that kind of flows through, but more directly you have um, a couple of smaller sub-watersheds right around Sunset Bay. And um, that's kind of the focus area for any of the recommendations that talk about, you know, supporting watershed implementation efforts of your neighbors and educating property owners in Sunset Bay about what's going on um, to address some of that pollution. Any questions about that before we continue with the baseline assessment? All right, so um, water quality monitoring was conducted by volunteers last summer from May into October at nine sites in Sunset Bay. Um, and then we also have a long-term trend site where we have volunteers monitoring in Lake Udemore. And that one site was used for comparison to Sunset Bay for water clarity. Um, the the volunteers were trained and um, we provided equipment. They used their own boats and donated their time. And so um, without them, we wouldn't have this baseline assessment. And so I just want to thank any of the volunteers who happen to be on the phone um, for your dedication to this. So the volunteers measure dissolved oxygen, temperature, pH, water clarity, and documented um, some of the algae conditions. And this map here kind of shows where all of those locations were in Sunset Bay. And that'll become relevant as we as we're walking through. So dissolved um, oxygen is important because um, Oh, I just faced on it, but dissolved oxygen is really important for aquatic life. So that's the type of oxygen that's available to um, your fish or your amphibians when they're underwater, things like that. Um, when dissolved oxygen is less than five parts per million, um, it's considered to be an impairment because that's where a lot of our aquatic organisms start to become stressed. If you um, look at, so in Sunset Bay, the average monthly dissolved oxygen, um, if you, you can kind of see a seasonal pattern. In June, it was higher, and we also had cooler temperatures in, in June than we do in August, um, and colder water is going to um, hold more dissolved oxygen, so that makes sense. And then as we get into the summer, we see a decline, and then we um, start to rise again through in September and October. And now these averages are monthly averages across all the Sunset Bay sites. If we look at the average dissolved oxygen by monitoring station, so taking all of the dissolved oxygen readings that we had at one particular station and aver averaging them for the season, um, we can kind of see like which sites had higher dissolved oxygen. And it's interesting um, that the site that had the highest average was actually the site that's um, most connected with the rest of Lake Udemore. So if we look at um, dissolved oxygen on kind of a monthly standpoint, now, this graph, at least for me, is can be intimidating when you look at it. 
but what I really want to, um, what I want the take home message to be is we had dissolved oxygen fall down into the hypoxic zone, which is um, well under the impaired um, impairment threshold of five parts per million. And so in August, we saw a really, really kind of steep drop um, into that low oxygen zone. And so you can kind of see over the season um, how that played out there. Oh, I, um, the one thing I did want to mention too is that, you know, around the same time, um, we're seeing from, you know, July into August, we're seeing die offs of curly leaf pondweed, um, as because that plant generally prefers you know, cooler temperatures and kind of starts growing a lot earlier than our natives. And so it senesces earlier um, than our natives, although it, some plants will persist through the rest of the season. Um, and as that curly leaf pondweed, because it grows so dense in Sunset Bay in certain areas, as that dies off and starts to decay, that decomposition process will use up some of that um, dissolved oxygen and will contribute to the decline in oxygen levels, as well as the increasing temperatures. Um, when the water is warmer, it, it can't hold on to as much dissolved oxygen as it can when it's cooler. Any questions about dissolved oxygen? And Emily, feel free to jump in too if I'm if I miss something or misspeak as we go along. Um, so then we also looked at water temperature, and water temperature affects a number of factors in the lake. So as we already talked about, it affects how much um, dissolved oxygen the water can hold. It affects the reaction rates and solubility of chemicals, and so it affects chemical processes. Um, it impacts water density and stratification, although we don't really have um, a concern about stratification in these lakes because they're so shallow. Um, it affects growth and reproduction, the metabolism of plants and animals. Um, it'll affect species composition because some species have a preferred um, temperature range. and also affects environmental cues for life, life history stages. And so, you know, fish, spawning or insect emergence, as well as, you know, growth of um, our aquatic plants and things like that. So temperature is a big deal when it comes to um, aquatic ecosystems. So water temperatures um, peaked in kind of that July period for the most part. And then once we got to um, kind of the end of August, temperatures really started to, to drop. Um, most of the sites that were measured were pretty similar, you know, within um, 10 degrees of each other and followed a similar pattern. The outlier here is really um, the Sunset Bay location at, at SBO4. And this might be, especially during the hotter months, we see a lot, a lot of difference with that location than we do some of the other spots. And this might be because um, we believe there's a natural spring that discharges from the lake bottom around that site. And groundwater um, maintains kind of relatively consistent temperature of around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that would kind of keep that water around that spring a little bit cooler during the summer months. Does anyone know the exact location of that that spring over there? Here, if I go to, this will probably help. So, SBO4 is kind of in in here. So I'd be curious yep. if to. Find that out. runs, yeah, that runs right along Edgewood. That Edgewood Drive that comes in. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so there's got to be some groundwater kind of coming in there. Because um, we noticed some other interesting things with that site, too. And that was one of your sites, right, Terry? Yes, that was one that we did. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is pH. So pH is the potent, what stands for potential of hydrogen, which is the measure of the amount of hydrogen ions present in a substance. Um, you know, basically it's representing um, how acidic something is or how basic something is. And so a lot of you are probably familiar with that, with, you know, zero being the most acidic, 14 being very basic, and seven representing kind of a, a neutral pH. Most surface waters in the U.S. are between 6.5 and 8.5 pH. Um, an optimal pH for a, most aquatic, uh, freshwater aquatic species is between seven and nine. Um, changes in pH can increase the solubility of nutrients such as phosphorus. So that's something that's really important to pay attention to. Um, and optimal pH for blue green algae blooms is between 8.2 and 8.7. So I'm not going to go into a lot of this. A lot of the background behind a lot of these parameters is available in the plan. Um, so pH is a water quality criteria for aquatic life in Wisconsin lakes um, for impairments. And so a lake should be between six and nine um, to be within the criteria for aquatic life. Um, one thing to note when you're looking at the pH data up here, that pH are not um, displayed or looked at by average. They're supposed to be displayed um, by median. And so everything else is done with averages except for pH. Um, and so again, you know, that SpO4, so up here where we think there's um, likely a spring nearby, really had a, a different kind of pH story than the rest of the locations. Um, you know, overall, we saw that, you know, by site, SBO4 had the lowest pH, um, and a lot of the other sites had a pretty high pH. We also see that, um, Several of the sites exceed the aquatic life criteria um, for pH in July and August. Um, so we're not quite sure, you know, why that is. There, there's a number of reasons that could be affecting um, where pH is at for Sunset Bay. The plan kind of highlights some of the possibilities, um, but if this is a concern it would need to be studied further definitely um, was interesting to us as we were going through the data another baseline water quality um, parameter we looked at was water clarity so water clarity is important because it affects how far sunlight can reach the water um, water column low water clarity is due to increased um, is due to the, uh, the amount of particles that are suspended in the water column. So that could be suspended, you know, sediment, that could be, um, you know, small floating aquatic plants like, like duckweed, or it could be because of, you know, filamentous algae or blue-green algae. Um, water clarity is highly variable um, by the day, by the season, and from year to year. It can also be different depending on the location and the same lake at the same time. And so it's important to keep that in mind when we're looking at wet water um, clarity data. So a lot of times a Secchi disk is used to kind of measure water clarity or, or turbidity. Um, and the results from a, a Secchi disk, also called a Secchi depth, can be used to estimate the maximum depth potential um, for plant growth. So for example, if, if sunlight 
Um, if the, a Secchi disc measures water clarity to two feet, then we can multiply that by um, 2.5, which is kind of that, that, that photic zone factor, and get a, a rough estimate that plants would be able to receive enough sunlight for photosynthesis at a depth of five feet um, in the lake at that particular time. That's another example of how the water clarity or the secchi depth can be really helpful. So this is a graph that shows the secchi depth results for Sunset Bay at the different water quality stations um, by month. And so if we look at this first one, so um, location um, one in Sunset Bay, this is this is kind of a a graph that's reversed, and so the top here, zero, would be um, the water surface. And as we go down, we see increasing depths. And so the bottom here is five. And so that would be a depth of five feet. And as we look at each of these sites from June, um, July, August, into September, and then October, we see kind of a similar pattern where we start out with um, you know, clarity to, to um, greater depths, and then we see lower water clarity as we get into the summer months. And as we come out of the summer months, we start to see water clarity increase again. Um, again, that, that Sunset Bay, that site four, is a little bit different, but still um, has some, resembles the, the pattern of the other sites um, somewhat. So there, the, the um, SB4, there's a little channel that go, that is right there. So, and, and the water depth is very, very shallow. So that might have something to do with it too. That's a really good point. And that, that is in the narrative in the plan. Um, thanks for bringing that up, Brad. So the spot here is really shallow. So the clarity was likely deeper, but um, can only be measured to around two, um, just to two to just over two feet, depending on um, where water levels were at, because that was as deep as, as that site could go. And so that secchi disc was hitting bottom um, a lot of the time. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that's in the, the, the graphs, um, uh, what do you call it, the little caption that goes with it. I should I should have marked that on here. Um, so if we look at average secchi depths by month, um, we are still seeing kind of that similar pattern, and we also see a similar pattern with Lake Butamore. Although Lake Butamore um, more often has um, uh, deeper secchi depths than Sunset Bay um, based on the 2021 data. And then if we look at the average secchi depth by site, again, you can see that SPO4, um, that's kind of the deepest that that location gets is that two feet. And that's why we, we saw that pattern in the previous slide. Um, but what's interesting, if you look at site seven, you know, the average, here's the average secchi depth or the average water clarity. Um, but here's the potential just based on water depth. So this is saying that at site seven, um, water depth was just under six feet. And at site two, the water depth is um, about four feet, but the average depth was around two and a half feet for water clarity. Any questions about water clarity? All right, so um, algae. Algae blooms generally occur from June to October when conditions are ideal. When I say ideal conditions, I mean ideal for algae blooms. Um, which typically follows excessive rains and warm weather. And then, you know, especially if following excessive rains with warm wet weather, you have calm kind of stagnant conditions. Um, 
this past year in a lot of areas of the lakes we saw some pretty intense blooms into mid-november um that was a was pretty late for the severity of algae blooms we were seeing did anyone see blue green algae blooms in sunset bay that late into the year last year I'll take that as a no, and that's a really good thing. Um, hopefully, that was just kind of a little bit of an anomaly um, this past year, and we don't see that, but um, we'll see what happens this year. So along with algae, we asked in the Sunset Bay survey how um, people feel, you know, how often do algae neg negatively impact their enjoyment of Sunset Bay? Um, and more than half of the 52 respondents who answered this question indicated that their enjoyment was um, always or often impacted by algae. Now this question didn't differentiate between blue-green algae or filamentous algae, it just talked about algae in general. And then if we break that down by area, um, you know, we see that the respondents from area B and C are more often impacted by algae blooms than some of the other areas, which um, reported just sometimes have being impacted. And these are averages by area, and so that's why the results appear a little bit differently than they do in um, just displaying the, the straight responses. So filamentous algae are single cells that reproduce and form together, creating kind of long hair-like strands. Um, it's a type of green algae, and it starts growing near the bottom of the lake, typically where sunlight can reach the lake bottom. And then um, as the algae you know, continues to grow and create these hair-like strands and create clumps, um, gases can form underneath the algae, which then um, makes the algae float to the surface. And when it's at really high densities, you get these mats, um, like this picture here from Sunset Bay. And they can really impede navigation and other types of recreation. And as the algae die and decay, it, um, these mats give off a really offensive odor. And so it can really affect um, you know, enjoyment of, of the bay. And so we asked people how familiar they are with filamentous algae. Um, and the results of this kind of helped us determine that um, some algae identification might be really helpful for residents to be able to differentiate between filamentous algae and blue-green algae, because al although both can be a nuisance, um, one is a, um, is a public health concern and can, can be um, toxic, and the other one is more just a, an aesthetic nuisance or a nuisance to navigation. So our water quality monitoring volunteers were asked to kind of record the severity of filamentous algae um, based on their personal observations at each site. And so their observations were recorded on a scale of zero to five, with zero being no filamentous algae and five being thick layers that block sunlight. Um, locations that experienced high density of filamentous algae were sites uh, three, four, and seven through nine. And then um, the sites three and four show high densities in July and August with no filamentous algae observed in October while sites seven through nine, um, some of the filamentous algae kind of popped up during that, that late season time period. And again, you know, these are based on, on personal observations from the, the trained volunteers. And so um, there's always gonna be some of that, um, that wiggle room in these, these values just based on, um, you know, how people um, perceive the severity of the bloom. Blue-green algae, which are also known as cyanobacteria, are not actually algae. 
Um, they're, they're a type of photosynthetic bacteria. And what a lot of people may not know is that they are a natural part of a lake ecosystem, but that's in small quantities. What we see are um, kind of unnatural densities of blue-green algae blooms. And that's a concern because um, in our local lakes, most organisms do not eat blue-green algae. And so um, they don't really have an effective predator. And um, they also have the potential to release toxins as they die. And as they die, they use up dissolved oxygen, um, which affects other aquatic life. And so we asked people, you know, how familiar they were with blue-green algae. Um, and again, you know, here we just, we didn't see a significant amount of confidence in people's um, ability to identify blue-green algae. And this, for me, raised a little bit of a red flag and um, indicated that some education would be really helpful. So when we look at the results from the volunteers and their perception of blue-green algae at each site, um, we kind of see that, you know, sites that what was reported was, you know, high amounts of blue-green algae in, um, higher amounts of blue-green algae in the July and August timeframes, which it kind of matches what we would expect to see just based on when we have that warmer, warmer wa water temperature. Um, for SB 7, 8, and 9, um, we just had a, a couple of questions about the, um, the recording of those values. And so we just want to note that because this is based on you know, perception, um, that these values should be used to inform you know, monitoring plans or to help kind of guide um, you know some of the some of the management, but shouldn't be necessarily taken 100% uh, at face value because there is that room for um, differences in how people are perceiving the severity. So um, here's just a reminder that if you have any doubts about there being a harmful algal bloom or in other words, a blue-green algae bloom that is at a higher density, which means it has higher potential to produce toxins. Um, you're better off just staying out of the water. There are a lot of lookalikes, and so that's why you know we say with identifying blue-green algae, there's um, likely some room for educating property owners. Um, people oftentimes can get duckweed mixed up or filamentous algae versus blue-green algae or pollen. I've also heard a lot in the last couple of years from people in the system um, that they say, well, no, what I'm seeing is green in color. So it's a green algae and that means it's safe. Um, when in reality, blue green algae is, can be you know, kind of misleading because it, blue green algae or cyanobacteria can show up as you know, a bright green or a deep green, as well as that um, more kind of blue, green color. Any questions about the um, algae or water quality or anything before we move forward? All right. And again, there is that chat option. If um, you do have a question that you want to throw out there for us to cover, um, later on. So the, the um, management plan really gives a lot of information about this background um, material and habitat and things like that, but I'm going to kind of skim the surface here uh, with a lot of the stuff and just mention that when we talk about habitat for a lake, we're talking about everything from kind of the, the upland or you know, within a thousand feet of the shoreline and that transition from upland down to um, the deeper areas where light no longer reaches the bottom. And so that transition is really important. And we often see in um, lakes that are heavily developed is a loss in that transition where there's a structure or some type of change to the shoreland area or property um, where we lose this riparian wetland into the littoral zone. 
um, type habitat. So just keep that in mind as we're kind of moving along here. Um, we're also, we're gonna talk about aquatic plants and when we talk about aquatic plants, we're talking about floating leaf plants, free floating plants, emergent plants and submerged plants. And so floating leaf plants would be things like American lotus, um, white water lily, free floating plants would be like your duckweed, um, your emergent plants would be things like your cane beds, and then your submerged plants would be things like um, your uh, your coontails or your milfoils, things like that. So aquatic plants are extremely important because um, not only do they provide habitat for aquatic animals, but they also stabilize the sediments. And um, preventing sediment resuspension means we have better water clarity. They buffer against that wind wave energy, and so they help protect shorelines. Um, they compete for phosphorus in the system, and they're an important source of dissolved oxygen although they can also be a sink depending on the time of day. So I just wanted to kind of quickly talk about the different types of plants because um, we're gonna be talking about aquatic plants here for a little bit. And I wanted to highlight the just amount of habitat loss that's happened in Lake Butamore over the last 150 years. Um, this is a due to a combination of increased water levels from the installation of the dams, the high water levels during the spring, during the critical plant growth period, where the water temperatures and sediment are, are reaching around um, that 55 degrees and plants are starting to grow. Um, if water levels are, if, if the water clarity is low and water levels are too deep, we don't see um, those plants growing at the right times, and so we lose aquatic plant habitat if that occurs year after year. Um, and then as the lake started to open up over you know time with a lot of this happening, um, we had stronger um, impacts from wind and wave because we have longer corridors where the wave energy is um, able to flow unobstructed. And so if we look at this slide, um, and this is adapted from a, a publication that's used quite a bit in the system. Um, up here we see the um, open water in 1862 is kind of the blue area, and the marsh bog in 1862 is that is the greenish color with the dots. So if you look at Sunset Bay, most, there, I don't see, um, and this is, at the scale, it's a little difficult, but there really isn't any open water um, based on the study that was done back um, when they looked back at the conditions in 1862. If we look now at this, the lower left image, we see that um, where open water kind of ex exists to the present day. And the remnant cane beds in the system. Um, so the vegetation that was kind of left over from where, what it was in 1862 is now just in those um, kind of black shaded areas. And so when you look at the cane beds in Sunset Bay, that kind of acts as that um, the outer kind of protection for the bay, you're really looking at what's left out of all of this. And so that's another reason why Sunset Bay is um, so valuable to a lot of conservation professionals and as habitat in the system. Um, because historically, it, it, it kind of, that's what's left. Um, it's right in your backyard. So just to, again, drive this home and some, you know, some of you may have already seen these pictures from past presentations, but, um, and this isn't necessarily Sunset Bay, this is just, these are photos from Lake Butamore, but the top photo is from 1912 in Lake Butamore, and from um, the bottom photos in 2012 from the same vantage point in Lake Butamore. And so that just kind of shows again the, the stark contrast um, and the loss that's happened over time. 
So estimates um, for loss between 1916 and 1970s is about 11,000 acres of marsh in the three upper pool lakes. And so that's um, Poygan, Winnicani, and Butamore combined. So it's, uh, it's, it's been pretty devastating over the last century. So what does it look like today? Well, um, emergent plants were mapped in 2018 by Winnebago County and the DNR. And what we see here is um, in Sunset Bay, um, this map shows the emergent plant beds and the floating leaf plant beds. So the floating leaf is where you're getting um, your you know, white water lily, your American lotus, and then the emergent plant beds is represent represents things like the cane beds and things. Um, so this kind of shows a zoom in of Sunset Bay, which again, if you look at the larger Lake Butamore, what is left um, represents the majority of, of what we have currently. Oh, that's a little fuzzy. All right, and then we took a look at, this past summer, um, we took a look at aquatic plants in Sunset Bay through what's called a point intercept survey. So basically a point intercept survey, um, we put a bunch of dots in a grid in a map and we visit each one of these sites and we put a, um, a plant rake into the bottom to, um, sample aquatic plants. And so that's basically how we get, you know, across Sunset Bay, what the aquatic plant conditions are. Um, and this is fuzzier than I intended it to be, and it's a lot of information, but this is a table that's in the Sunset Bay plan that basically kind of just lists and summarizes all the statistics that came out of the aquatic plant. Um, survey. So we visited 327 sites out of 378 proposed sites. So basically um, the grid had 378 locations due to navigational um, barriers. We were only get, able to get to 327. 122 of those sites were vegetated. And um, on average, there were about uh, three species found at each site that was shallower than the max depth of plants. And the max depth of plants is basically the, the deepest um, depth where plants were found during the survey. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, but we're gonna walk through a couple of them in particular. So this map here shows the density um, based on rake fullness. And so when we put the rake down and we pull it back up, the rake is given a rating, a fullness rating, where zero would be no plants, one is um, where you have a couple of plants, two is where you have um, you know, kind of coverage of the base of the rake, and then three is where the rake is just kind of overflowing with vegetation. So um, if you're able to see it, depending on your screen size, kind of up in the top right corner shows a rake fullness of three. Um, and it, we, I, I should also mention that we were able to do this survey and save um, quite a bit of money on it because we had uh, a generous volunteer who donated his time and captained his own boat to get us from location to location. And I have to say, he's probably one of the better captains um, I've had with doing one of these surveys. So we were quite impressed. Um, Very true. He did better than a lot of interns that I worked with over an entire summer. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it made it go, um, made it go quick and, and we got it done. Um, so this, this map, we took the, that, that fullness rating for the rake and, um, we interpolated between the points to get kind of this, 
almost like a heat map of where we're seeing the highest density and then lower density. And if it doesn't have any of the color, if it's just a, a little empty zero, um, that means there were no plants found at that site. Um, and this, this map for the fullness rating was used at, to kind of map out the lanes and prescribe the treatments in the, um, the nuisance management plans. We also saw really high um, species richness, which was really cool in, in this in this system because it is a degraded system. Um, but again, it just goes to show the value of Sunset Bay. And so on the, the right is just a big list of all of the species that have either been found in Sunset Bay or Lake Butamore um, and has you know check mark next to the ones that were found. Um, in which survey. So overall, 24 different species were found on the rake as it was pulled in. Um, the 24 different native species, 26 species, including um, two of those were invasive species were found on the rake. And then when we include visuals, so species that we saw but were not um, pulled in on, at, on the rake at any point, we add all that together, we saw you know, a total of 30 different species. When we compare the species richness to Lake Butamore, other lakes within the same kind of region as Lake Butamore, and then statewide across Wisconsin, um, Sunset Bay has you know, a, a really high native species richness. So really something special. We also use something called the coefficient of conservatism. And so this gives each plant a value um, in a range from zero to 10, and it coincides with the quality of the system a plant can grow in, as well as how common the plant is found. And so this means that species that have a lower C value are generally more tolerant of um, disturbed waters and are more common. And species with a higher C value are more sensitive, and so they are typically found in pristine habitats and tend to be more rare species. Um, what's really cool is we did see a visual of pickerel weed, which is has a high C value. Um, and then we did see um, you know, several species that have you know, seven, six, seven, and then another eight. So, um, so stiff pondweed is another one that has a high C value. Oh yeah, and the the white water crowfoot, which was really cool to find. I wish I also finding the stonewort snipella. What Emily was very cool. Emily, I think I cut you off. What did you say? I'm sorry. Finding the stoneworts, Nitella, um, that's a macro algae which hasn't been found in Lake uh, Butamore before. And that one we're thinking is probably present due to the springs again. Oh yeah, that, that wouldn't be on this list. Um, no, it should be. I'm gonna have to make a note of that. It's on there. Is it? Oh, here it is. Stoneworts, okay, yeah. Yeah, that was really cool too. It was it was honestly a joy to be out there looking at all the plants. Um, if you happen to be a plant nerd like us, so we also have some other values that that go to show just how awesome Sunset Bay is for habitat um, quality and quantity. So the floristic quality index, the higher an FQI value for a lake indicates the healthier an aquatic plant community. And so with the survey, we are looking at Sunset Bay as kind of a lake. Um, then when we look at Sunset Bay, the, the statistics came out that Sunset Bay had an FQI of 26 versus Lake Butamore had 21. And then if we look at statewide average of um, just over 22. So again, you know, way to go Sunset Bay, 
scoring really high here. And then the diversity index. So Samson's diversity index is a measure of, of plant diversity within the lake. Um, and that basically describes a probability that two plants sampled in the same lake are of different species. And a higher value means higher diversity of a plant community. Um, and again, Sunset Bay had higher values indicating um, higher diversity and so higher quality plant community. Hopefully I'm not boring you too much, but we're almost done with these statistics. Um, Another thing we look at is littoral frequency of occurrence. So how frequent was a particular plant species found? Um, the most common ones that we saw were common waterweed, coontail, which a lot of you are probably familiar with coontail. Um, unfortunately, the invasive Eura Eurasian water milfoil. We saw a lot of filamentous algae, which was no surprise. Um, Southern naiad, lots of duckweed. And water meal, which are all those um, those floating plants, water celery or sorry, wild celery, which is a really important um, food for waterfowl, water star grass, American lotus, um, and the list goes on. And this this list is much longer. I just kind of cut it off around the three percent mark with the white water lily. Another thing that's measured during the aquatic plant survey is the dominant sediment type. And so um, we look at kind of, is it mucky, is it rock, or is it sand? And I took the results of that and put it up here on a map and with these points. And so most of Sunset Bay, um, at least at the locations where we sampled, were muck with um, you know kind of this, this line of, of sand around here. Um, this makes sense to me, especially if there is a, a spring around here, because a lot of times you're going to find sand around um, around a spring like that. And then just a few areas um, that had rock. All right, we'll jump right into what are aquatic invasive species. Um, there are non-native plants, animals, or pathogens that have potential to cause harm to health, the environment, or the economy. Examples that are commonly known are zebra mussels, curly leaf pondweed, and Eurasian water milfoil. Invasive, invasive plants that um, are of importance in Sunset Bay are important to note are flowering rush, curly leaf pondweed, Eurasian water milfoil, and purple loosestrife. Um, some notes about these species, Eurasian water milfoil can typically grow anywhere from 3 to 20 feet. Um, as it goes to the surface, it can start growing along the surface and create just long strands of with mats. Curly leaf pondweed can grow beneath the lake, um, the lake ice in winter and is often one of the first aquatic plants to emerge. Um, in spring, purple loosestrife, every plant of purple loosestrife can produce over 2.5 million seeds each year. So it's, it's prolific and spreads quite rapidly in areas where it shows up. Um, and flowering rush, the leaves are, um, that's not the leaves, it's the stems are triangular shaped and twist as they grow. Gotta fix that one. So here's the, a picture of the flowers of flowering rush. One thing you'll find is a lot of invasive species are quite beautiful, um, but they just they still don't belong here, so don't plant it. We did find a, uh, a submerged um, kind of, I guess, for lack of a better word, a baby flowering rush um, in this one location of Sunset Bay, and then we had a couple of visuals over here. Um, as well, but nothing, nothing too bad. It's something that can be at this point easily controlled by just hand pulling as that plant comes up and then properly disposing of in the garbage away from the water. Eurasian water milfoil, um, it looks similar to our native milfoil and in the Winnebago system, it's also been known to um, hybridize with our native and so we start to get kind of some strange looking plants that can be tricky to, to differentiate between native or invasive or hybrid. Um, 
but here's where we found Eurasian water milfoil and um, also the, the rate density. And so these spots where we have green, that means that milfoil on the rake was was quite dense, um, was a value of two. Otherwise, it was just it was found at these locations. So it was quite common when we did this survey in August, early August. Curly leaf pondweed. Um, when we did this survey in August, it was kind of after the time when curly leaf pondweed starts to die back, and so the full extent of the issues with curly leaf pondweed wouldn't have been documented with this particular survey. Um, but we do have some documentation from the property owners that show where the density is um, was during kind of the more peak growth in June, July. Um, but as you can see, it can still kind of sustain after its big dieback um, right before August. Okay, any questions about the baseline information? All right, so I'm gonna jump right into the action plan. Um, and basically the action plan says, you know, we, we know this stuff, we know this is what property owners wanna see. And so here are some ways that we're recommending, um, you know, how to best kind of address these issues. And I, I know many of you have already heard this, but just a reminder that we have to be cognizant of our expectations versus reality. Um, because we only have so much control over the natural world and we need to really think about the lake's natural characteristics as we're um, planning for management. Otherwise, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. So the action plan is a strategy that attempts to balance the desire of property owners to alleviate nuisance vegetation for recreation while also protecting habitat and addressing the water quality and um, invasive species introductions. So users of the bay enjoy time on the water. Um, we know from the survey results that there's a lot of longevity in the people who live around the bay and who are spending time on the bay. Um, we know that the aquatic plant community is of high quality and good diversity. And we know that even though we have really great quality habitat in Sunset Bay, um, and it's really a gem in the system, that we are seeing aquatic plants grow to nuisance levels in certain areas. And that the majority of people who responded to the survey agree that some management is, is needed. We also know that aquatic invasive species are a constant threat to the quality of the lake. Um, and some species are present in high um, frequency and densities. And we also know that um, you know, some respondents to the survey preferred certain management actions over others. So with all that in mind, the action plan, the goals that were developed for the action plan are to improve water quality, improve shoreline conditions, protect and restore habitat, prevent new introductions of invasive species, and detect new introductions early manage nuisance vegetation to improve recreation and navigation, engage property owners in local management of the bay, and then to monitor, evaluate, and revise the Sunset Bay plan over the years um, as is needed in at least every five years. Each goal that's listed here um, has objectives and related recommended actions. So the first goal is to improve water quality in Sunset Bay. Um, we know, you know, based on stakeholder input and the impairments that we need to reduce the frequency and intensity of algae blooms, improve water clarity, um, and help to educate property owners on the sources of phosphorus and the actions needed to reduce phosphorus pollution. Um, you know, thankfully, there are changes happening in agricultural practices, in wastewater treatment, and stormwater management. Um, as, as a lot of people are putting effort into meeting reduction goals outlined in these watershed scale plans. Um, so although the change, although the scale of change that's needed 
is really beyond the scope of the plan when we're talking about these watershed level changes there are things that Sunset Bay property owners can do um, to be part of that larger solution and helping to improve and protect Sunset Bay specifically. So that's where these um, this objective and actions come in and so the objective for goal one is to reduce external nutrient and sediment loading to Sunset Bay. Then what that looks like is really um, recommending that Sunset Bay property owners support their watershed neighbors in efforts, um, in their efforts to reduce pollution. And so, you know, learning about what's happening around the local farms and learning about opportunities for residents to implement on their own properties, even though that reduction is going to be much smaller than the agricultural implementation that's happening, it's still um, part of the solution and it's still part of being um, in that, you know, phosphorus reduction community. And so, you know, suggestion is to partner with a local farm to host a field day for area residents to learn about agricultural conservation, how to spot agricultural conservation practices when you're driving around, um, understand what's happening on the land. Um, in understanding kind of the, the length of time that these agricultural practices take to implement. Um, staying informed on phosphorus reduction efforts in the region, preventing further loss and degradation um, of in-lake vegetation to make sure that, that we're protecting the natural um, attenuation of wave energy. So maintaining those those cane beds and things that are um, slowing down that wave energy and reducing that internal loading. And then encouraging property owners to implement um, and maintain shoreline best management practices that are outlined in goal two. Um, additional options that are, are put out here but aren't listed as recommendations, you know, if, if property owners get together and want to take it to a different level. Um, they, you know, you could look at engaging your municip municipalities and elected officials to increase their support and adoption of conservation practices on the land. Um, you know, and that might be partnering with a regional organization to host a field day for those elected officials and community leaders. Um, Encouraging your urban communities to implement stormwater best management practices to reduce the quantity and improve quality of runoff. And in you know, some smaller communities, that might look like you know, um, requiring different subdivision designs when expanding um, populated areas or, or that kind of thing. Any questions about goal one or um, the objective? All right, we'll keep moving right along then. Um, again, don't uh, hesitate to use your chat option. Emily's there um, to moderate any questions that come through. The second goal is to improve shoreline conditions. And so, um, you know, that 3.5 miles of shoreline that surrounds Sunset Bay is uh, mostly developed for residential use. And so the recommendations under goal two are, um, are meant to improve shoreline conditions, um, you know, to reduce erosion, improve habitat, improve water quality again, you know, just that theme that kind of goes through, as well as increase awareness and understanding of shoreline related issues. So the first objective under goal two is to increase adoption of lawn care and landscaping best management practices. And so the um, this is kind of your your level one, your ground level effort or, or investment level into um, reducing runoff or reducing the pollutants that are reaching the lake by just making some simple changes in, in practices. Um, and so 
before applying any fertilizers, making sure to test the soils and that the fertilizers are applied correctly. Um, leaving our leaves on land instead of, you know, pushing them into the lake, please don't do that. Um, we're having them kind of pile up in a, a collection in a, um, if you happen to have storm drains around the storm drains and things. Um, sweeping grass clippings off of hard surfaces, such as driveways and sidewalks, because all that gets kind of washed, washed away and contributes to phosphorus in the lake. Cleaning up pet waste. Um, pet waste not only contributes nutrients to the lake, but also, um, you know, E. coli. And um, it's just, you know, we don't want that bacteria and things in the lake, especially after a storm event. And then locating your fire pits a little bit away from the lake and cleaning up the ash periodically. Um, it's surprising, you know, how much that the fire pit ash can contribute phosphorus to a lake system. And so it's kind of a simplified version. There's a lot more detail about these different practices in the plan itself. Um, this is a high priority because it is a lower level of effort and investment and can be done um, you know, affordably for little to no cost. And the target is for over 50% of the properties around Sunset Bay to be regularly practicing long hair BMPs um, beginning in 2021 with the target reached by um, 2025. So, you know, five years to get at least 50% of the property owners practicing um, one or more of these lawn care BMPs. An option that can kind of go along with that is to encourage property owners to sign a pledge that they will follow the lawn care best management practices. Um, so basically having them sign a pledge is they're signing that they understand what those practices are and that they're going to implement one or two of them. And of course, it's, you know, it's a it's a voluntary thing, um, but it it can help with getting people to have a little bit more motivation for going that extra step. Um, with protecting the lakes. The second objective is to install shoreline BMPs to reduce erosion, improve habitat, and protect water quality. Um, so this is kind of the, the next level of investment in both um, you know, effort and financial resources. And so the first recommendation is to um, for Sunset Bay to complete a shoreline inventory to really determine the needs for shoreline improvements. And so we have things outlined here, but I think that those goals or targets can be better refined after a shoreline inventory is completed. Um, a shoreline inventory would also help to be able to go back and assess progress. And so if the inventory were to be redone, um, it would give a good indication of, as to if targets were actually met. Um, we also, with this, want to recommend that uh, fish sticks are installed in Sunset Bay. The suggested location is behind the Shangri-La break wall, um, and this is a high priority. Um, it fits right in with the uh, recommendations for the larger Lake Butamore in the Lake Butamore Lake Management Plan. Um, and these types of projects provide you know, habitat enhancements where a lot of our lake system is, um, the habitat's really the same where it's just, it's kind of like large expanses of mucky bottom with not much complexity where um, fish sticks help to improve that complexity and provide, um, you know, basking sites for turtles, nesting sites for birds, habitat for fish. Um, so it really, really helps with enhancement. We also um, put in here to dramatically increase the amount of native shoreline buffers, so native plants along the shoreline. Um, and 
what we would like to see at a bare minimum is 25% of the shoreline in Sunset Bay planted at least 10 feet deep with native plants. Um, that seems like a lot, but um, you know, if we break it down incrementally, you know, we can start to see, okay, 2021 would be um, maybe two projects, 2022 might be four projects to get to that, that total target. Um, and that, with that, it's, it's a high priority. There definitely is some cost and effort investment as part of that level two category, but there is um, funding. So you guys are in Winnebago County. So you have, um, Winnebago County has a cost share program for these types of projects. And the DNR also has a cost share grant program. And you can use the county um, cost share program to as cost share for the DNR and vice versa. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, funding opportunity just given your location to you know pay for some of these projects. Um, and it's something that that our organization can def definitely help people kind of figure out and navigate. Um, and they don't need to look unruly and stuff and unkempt. There's definitely ways to do shoreline buffers to provide that water quality protection and that habitat um, in a more landscaped way. And Emily is really good at it. So, Corinne? Yes. I just want to ask your opinion. Um, a lot of the property owners, including us, have that riprap rock all along their shoreline. And that's quite deep and quite high. How is that compared to what you're talking about? So it depends on where you are, because there's definitely locations where you just, in the Winnebago system, where you just have to have riprap. Um, because we just have such high energy. Along Edgewood Lane, I think it's something that would be worth um, evaluating the the energy and, and things like that to see if there is a way to um, reduce the, the rock. But honestly, the number one thing for us would be to look at where do you have opportunities where you could put this type of buffer right behind that rock. Um, so you you still have that reinforcement of that rock riprap, but you have that, that native buffer behind it. And there's also things you can do to improve the connection between that buffer and the water. Um, if you not, if you don't experience a lot of, uh, you don't have a lot of potential for things like ice shoves and stuff. So it's really site dependent. Um, I guess, so I don't, I don't have a perfect answer for you, Terry, but there's, there's definitely options and um, it's something that our staff in the coming months, we're hoping to receive a grant from the DNR where we would have someone um, that has time allocated to be able to come out and do site visits to help a property owner evaluate their sites, look at the the, um, the potential of like, you know, slope and the types of soils and stuff and to work on that plan with the property owner. Um, so if you have existing riprap and you're not real comfortable with, you know, thinking about making alterations to that riprap um, after the wave energy and things are evaluated by an engineer, then um, I would definitely say that there's, we could look at, you know, going behind the riprap if, um, if the property owner felt there was enough, you know, space on their lot to be able to do that. Yeah, I just think that, you know, there was a lot of money invested already in, the, in their property with putting that riprap in there. Yep, yeah. and you can plant um into the riprap depending on how it was put in so you could mm -hmm. add native plants into the spaces between the riprap um also if you have like failing riprap or a seawall the dnr does have grants that can help pay to remove that and then replace it with native plants okay yeah terry so I, I, that's i think that's where i was going with that you know having someone come out and look at the site and talk with the property owner um, and kind of making those those case by case 
recommendations because if you're yeah if your rip wraps in good shape and you've invested all that money in it um what else can be done without disturbing that and stuff so we're definitely not saying that you have to remove rip wrap that's not a message that we're putting out there in the winnebago system um so how can we enhance it what you already have i think what we were trying to trying to say is could that um you know you said it should be 10 feet wide maybe we could reduce the 10 feet because we have rip wrap I, I wish I, I could say yes, but if you plan to utilize any of the state or county funding, they have really specific um, requirements for meet, you know, you have to meet specific requirements in order to receive all the funding. And so if you were just interested in planting, um, you know, your, on your own property with your, you know, your own time and money, we, our organization could definitely still help with that. Um, and I think that, you know, we could look at this recommendation if you guys wanted to revisit it um, and come up with a different way to, to total things. But that 10 feet deep was really set based on a lot of studies that were done on shoreline properties and what's effective for helping to reduce um, runoff from the land that flows over a shoreline property. Um, I don't know, Emily, do you have any thoughts on that? Nope, I agree with Corinne. Um, the riprap is good for stabilizing the shoreline against waves, but not helpful in stopping, slowing down any of the runoff coming from your property into the lake. So that's where that 10 feet comes into play. That's how much space you need to slow that water down and get it to infiltrate before it reaches the lake. But, you know, maybe it's worth Emily, maybe you and I could have a discussion about, um, you know, the idea of, you know, is there a way to offset any of this with other options like rain gardens before that riprap or something? Um, I'm not sure, but I think it's worth just having that conversation and considering it. Emily, would you mind making a note for me? That is exactly what I'm doing right now. Thank you. A few of the other recommendations that we have here are to um, divert runoff from impermeable surfaces. And so we would really like to see at least 50% of the properties diverting runoff. This can be as simple as, you know, if you have a downspout that's going onto your driveway. Um, you know, turning it so that it's going on to your lawn instead or um, rocks or maybe installing a rain garden um, if, you know, you're interested in that. And there's some really cool ways to do incorporate rain gardens into, um, into landscape design, um, you know, putting in a rain barrel or, or something to um, just get it so that you're not getting a lot of runoff as running over hard surfaces. We also think that it'd be, um, it's important to see additional Healthy Lakes Initiative projects installed. And so seeing new projects such as rain gardens, rock infiltration and diversion practices. So this is, these are installed projects, not just moving a, a downspout. Um, so five projects by 2025. And um, this is kind of a system-wide recommendation, and it's pretty common around the state to see no new installations of seawalls and to consider replacing um, failing existing seawalls with alternative shoreline reinforcement materials. Um, we know based on just how just modeling wave energy and things and also from observations and studies that seawalls actually contribute quite a bit to erosion along neighboring properties. Um, and you can kind of see that around Lake Winnebago. If you see a property that has a seawall, then one next to it is likely um, a lot further back and has a visible erosion that's happened where they've lost property. And so um, that's that recommendation there. We also like to see increased awareness, understanding of shoreline related issues and management options and restoration um, 
goals. And so things like creating and maintaining a Sunset Bay Facebook page or group so that you have a, a way to disseminate information, distributing educational materials to neighbors. So these can be things that are existing materials that you're putting out there or things that are specific to Sunset Bay. Um, again, with a lot of this stuff, there's, you know, there is, there are resources out there. There's um, groups that can provide assistance and, you know, you always are able to contact the, the Winnebago Waterways Program to um, host a native plant buffer workshop for Sunset Bay property owners or help promote attendance at a workshop that's already being hosted by an area organization. Um, you know, host a garden walk. So these are just ways to to get people to start like engaging in these types of shoreline um, property owner shoreline activities that we see around working around other lakes with other lake organizations. Any other questions about shoreline conditions? Where are we at for time? Oh shoot! Hopefully you haven't all fallen asleep on me. I know it's in the evening, and so my voice starts to get monotone the later it gets. So I'll try to inject a little bit of, um, of change to it. So goal three is to protect and restore habitat in Sunset Bay. Um, when we talk a little in a little bit about the, um, the action plan for managing nuisance vegetation, you're going to see that we have areas designated as protection where no aquatic plant management would happen. And on this slide, those areas are, are shown in the striped green. Um, and so we want to avoid, you know, damaging emergent and floating leaf plant beds, um, you know, ensure that aquatic plant management decisions result in minimal to no impacts to important habitat areas in Sunset Bay, and to avoid aquatic plant management activities in those areas. Um, we also have a, the objective of advocating for appropriate water level fluctuations. This is a, a system-wide issue where uh, water level fluctuations, the cer certain timing of fluctuations, and the differences in depth that we see um, can really impact the growth of aquatic plants. And so, um, you know, we recommend considering that Sunset Bay has a representative on the Winnebago Water Level Assessment Team which is a system-wide um, stakeholder group. Objective three is to enhance habitat through coarse woody projects. And so in addition to what's, what's um, already listed for under shoreline practice of, of installing that one fish stick projects to explore options and feasibility of installing coarse woody habitat in other areas that are not currently used um, for navigation, or even consider partnering with other organizations to install woody habitat projects in the greater Lake Butamore because it is a connected system. Um, so those benefits come around. And then partnering to maintain or build break walls. And so the existing break wall that you have in Sunset Bay is the Shangri-La break wall. Um, and this is just saying that you know if and when it's needed to partner with Winnebago County, um, to assist with that kind of break wall maintenance of that particular break wall. Um, I don't really have a time frame or anything for this. It's more just to document it in here to have the awareness um, of property owners that this could be a need in the future. Although those break walls are usually pretty stable and don't need too much maintenance. Um, another one is to get a sensitive area designation or critical habitat designation for portions of Sunset Bay. Um, this affords those areas additional protections and um, the time frame for this is to kind of begin those discussions with DNR around 2023, just looking at all the other things that are outlined in the plan. We also have land preservation, so explore opportunities to preserve land through the Sunset Bay Association um, and to educate property owners on the options for land preservation. Um, we've actually had a Sunset Bay property owner recently reach out to us with um, possible interest in this. And so um, you know, it's, it's a great way to make sure that some of that habitat is being protected in perpetuity. 
Then we also have wetland restoration, so working with the county or the DNR um, or other organizations. I, I should put in here like the Wisconsin Waterfowl Association, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Ducks Unlimited, um, to you know try to enhance the Shangri-La Nature Preserve wetland complex or expand it. And again, you know that's kind of a, just to put it out there on the radar. There's no target or time frame for that. Any questions about the habitat, um, the habitat stuff for goal three? All right, so I'm gonna keep going through this so that we have time to stop at um, goal five because I think that's where a lot of people wanna put a little bit of time. Um, so this is to goal four is to prevent new introductions of aquatic invasive species and to detect new introductions early. And so part of that is providing clean boat, clean water coverage um, around the system. And so this recommendation is to provide clean boat, clean water coverage at the Sunset Bay boat launch, especially during waterfowl season. Um, clean boat, clean waters is typically 200 hours per year at the boat launch. And um, there are grants available um, through the DNR to have a paid inspector at the boat launch. and their cost share, but the cost share can be offset with um, both, you know, monetary contributions as well as in-kind contributions. Um, and we also kind of suggested considering adopting or providing clean boat, clean water coverage at a different boat launch in the Winnebago system because of the, the Sunset Bay being highly connected. And we suggested that, you know, this kind of begin in 2021, um, where maybe you're not reaching the full 200 hours, but interested volunteers could get trained. Um, we can get trained through our program or there's a, the statewide coordinators as well um, and kind of get set up with supplies and stuff. So this is this the increased adoption of prevention measures through education. Um, this is something that we can really help with as well. We have you know, resources, there's state resources too that you can share. Um, you can host a workshop to train property owners on identifying invasive species, on monitoring and reporting out. Um, and so here we have suggested that you know, a workshop be held by the end of 2025, um, or you know, also getting a couple of volunteers or property owners trained as educators that can then train their neighbors um, on how to identify and look for invasive species. We also suggest that the, the Sunset Bay participate in um, statewide and system-wide events such as drain campaign and landing blitz. Um, monitor for AIS by participating in snapshot day and citizen lake monitoring and Adopt-A-Launch is a neighborhood. So Adopt-A-Launch is a system-specific um, program through um, Fox Wolf, and basically it's just organizations adopt a launch, and um, they visit it a couple times a year. They clean up garbage. They look for and report invasive species um, and just, you know, help to, to keep up the, you know, appearances of those boat launches. Any questions about that? So goal five is to manage nuisance vegetation to improve recreation and navigation. And with this, we're really saying that we want to improve recreational use by actively managing nuisance vegetation through informed decision making to prevent collateral damage to important aquatic habitat. Um, so we, we've talked about in previous, you know, public meetings that any aquatic plant, given the right condition, can grow to nuisance levels, whether it's invasive or it's native. Um, where vegetation was typically found during the plant survey last summer, growth was um, generally dense with an average rate fullness of about 2.4 out of 3. Um, and plants that were frequently observed growing in those dense mats were Eurasian water milfoil, um, curly leaf pondweed, although that was more early season documentation, um, common waterweed, and coontail. 
And so when we look at the survey, we asked people how often aquatic plants impact their enjoyment of Sunset Bay. Um, what we saw was um, that um, most Sunset Bay users were at least sometimes impacted by aquatic plants, with about 21% reporting that their enjoyment is always impacted. And when, again, if we break this down um, spatially and we kind of average responses across the, um, the different reporting areas, we see that B and C are experiencing impacts most often, um, with A and E experiencing impacts sometimes, and G and F um, reporting that they very rarely are impacted by invasive, or sorry, um, nuisance vegetation. When we asked um, the question, do you believe aquatic plant control is needed in Sunset Bay? This was um, pretty overwhelming that it's either definitely yes or probably yes. Um, with a smaller percentage saying that, you know, probably no or definitely no. And when we break it down by area, a, areas A, B, and C, so that definitely yes, aquatic plant control is needed. Um, e and F said, you know, probably yes, and uh, respondents from G kind of averaged out to being a little bit unsure if, if uh, control is needed. So when we looked at different techniques as we were forming a recommendation, we considered manual hand removal by property owners or volunteers, um, <clears throat> excuse me, manual removal by paid divers, Diver-assisted suction harvesting, mechanical harvesting, surface skimming, biocontrol, herbicide treatments, and the do-nothing option, so no plant management. And when we were considering things, we also factored in, you know, cost, effectiveness, legality, stakeholder acceptance, um, capacity, and alternatives. And as as you all as property owners in Sunset Bay are evaluating our recommendations, these are things that we suggest that you take into consideration too, um, you know, and, and give us feedback on. So in the survey, we asked um, people to tell us how supportive or how opposed they were for some of these management options. And the result was that the top, the the most support, um, the management technique that had the most support was mechanical harvesting, followed by manual removal, and then um, herbicide. Biocontrol had um, much lower support, but that might be because it um, wasn't really, you know, we didn't explain these options. so. There might have been um, some misunderstanding of what we meant by biological controls, um, but there may not be. So we're hoping to hear from some folks if, if that's an issue with the plan. Um, so this, this part of the plan can be a little bit confusing just because there's so much information packed in. So I'm going to just within the time that we have available, try to, to break it down a little bit. And then I'm just going to walk through kind of the recommendation, our top recommendation among the different options. And so objective um, 5.1 is to choose and implement a nuisance plant management strategy. And so our recommendation is to implement the action plan option one. And we list um, four different options in the plan. And what that looks like is it's an integrated pest management approach. And uh, an IPM approach is a science-based decision-making process that combines diverse treatment approaches with frequent monitoring and adaptive strategies. And so you have a, you know, a diverse um, set of tools that you're applying to the problem. You're monitoring the results of 
those the results of using those tools, and then you're incorporating adaptive management um, into that. And so the management techniques that are included as part of this IPM approach are protection, harvesting, herbicides, hand removal, surface skimming, and biological control of purple loose dry. Um, recommendations under the other goals, such as shoreline restoration, reducing surface water runoff, all of those things are part of an integrated pest management approach. Um, and will, in the long term, help with nuisance plant control. Um, and so when we say that IPM is a combination of management approaches where we have assessment, um, you know, cultural controls, mechanical and physical controls, things like that, you know, we're saying that it's incorporating that surface water runoff, shoreline restoration, AIS prevention, that kind of thing. So um, some of the management techniques that we recommended, um, I'm just going to walk through them quickly. There's a lot more information in the plan and in resources available online. But basically, mechanical harvesting uses equipment to cut areas of aquatic plants to below the water surface. So it's a lot like mowing the lawn. Harvesters range in size, speed, and price, but generally can cut plants from three to six feet deep in strips up to 10 feet wide. Um, this was a top choice for uh, management techniques among shoreline Sunset Bay property owners. So there's a lot of pros and a lot of cons, just like a lot of the all the other management techniques. What's really nice about mechanical harvesting is that uh, permits are multi-year and are renewable on a five-year cycle. Mechanical harvesting can take place anytime during the open water season without additional um, permits or permit revisions. Um, it doesn't kill the plant and it removes the plant fragments that are cut so you don't have big um, releases of nutrients from plant decaying plant material. Um, and you also maintain that sediment stabilization with the plants in place and have um, you still have habitat uh, quality, some of the habitat quality in the harvesting lanes. Um, some of the cons is the it requires significant infrastructure. So either you're making a big investment into purchasing equipment and operation and maintenance, as well as you know storage and disposal and that kind of thing, or you're hiring a contractor to complete the work. Um, and paying kind of per acre per hour for those contracted services. Manual or hand removal is hand pulling, raking, or hand cutting. So it's anything kind of done by hand. Um, it's typically done by volunteers or property owners. Um, sometimes people can hire paid contractors. It's the second choice supported by Sunset Bay property owners. If you're doing it with volunteers or with Sunset Bay property owners, um, there's low cost. You can have quick containment of new invasive plants that pop up because they can be hand pulled. Um, it can be, you can be very selective. And so if you're a property owner who only wants to select for native plants, you can go in and hand pull any of the invasive plants that come in. And in many cases, a permit isn't required if you follow um, certain rules. The cons are it's um, it's physically intensive, it's labor intensive, um, and if you're hiring contractors, there's a cost there, um, and then you also have to deal with the disposal of plant materials, which I, I know listening to property owners in the past has kind of been an issue. Herbicide treatments or chemical treatments applied at or below the water surface using spreaders, sprayers, or underwater hoses. It's the third most popular choice among Sunset Bay property owners. Um, you know, you have opportunity to apply herbicides in shallower areas than harvesting, and it can really work well around docks and things, and it's less physically demanding um, than hand pulling. And, you know, it can be applied throughout the growing season, depending on the types of chemicals used and, and dosages as well as um, weather conditions. The cons is herbicides can have negative public perception. Oftentimes it's due to um, 
I shouldn't say oftentimes, but sometimes it's due to uh, misunderstanding or some misinformation. So, you know, there are some really good um, documents that we we found throughout the planning process that we can share. There is a potential to affect non-target plant species. Um, it, there's a requirement to hire a certified applicator. There's definitely a cost associated. And plants are killed but aren't removed, which leads to large plant die-offs and, um, and a subsequent release of nutrients into the water. So with that, um, you know, going back to our, our goal and our objective 5.1, we have the integrated pest management approach. You know, we have our list of our management techniques that are included in that. Um, and the, the recommendation is then broken into the development of management zones. So zone A through zone E, depending on the management technique, the development of Sunset Bay Association management programs. Um, and so there's um, four programs listed there. And using those, we then listed out um, four different action plan options or scenarios. And the purpose of outlining the scenarios is to show that there's a lot of flexibility available when choosing a plant management action plan. Um, you know, and maybe there's a happy medium between the two or, or different things that would work. Um, depending on who's interested in being involved with it. So we're gonna start with um, the management zones and I'm just gonna describe kind of what that, what those are. So, oops. So the, the management um, zones are, you know, basically, well, I guess if we just walk through them, they're kind of self-explanatory, where zone A is protection. And so that's the grid area. No active management of nuisance vegetation should take place there. Then we have zone B, which is primary navigation. And so those are the yellow lanes that are shown in the map. Um, those generally would be mechanically harvested lanes, open for community access to and from open water, beginning at a depth of three feet. Um, the navigation lanes were drawn um, through areas known to have dense invasive species to improve navigation and minimize damage to native plants. The benefit of navigation lanes is they can also help um, to improve circulation a little bit in areas with high density. Zone C is the secondary navigation. Um, so these lanes are, it's a little hard to tell, but they're the orange ones underneath my red highlighter. Um, these would be maintained with herbicide applications and used to connect shoreline property access points to the primary navigation lanes in areas that are too shallow or difficult for a mechanical harvester to maneuver around. Zone D is the riparian access zone. And so that's kind of the reddish pink zone along the shoreline. And in that zone, riparian access would be maintained either through hand pulling or herbicide treatments in 30 foot wide areas from the shoreline to the end of the pier for each parcel. And if management is maintained within that area for each parcel, um, the, man the hand pulling can be done without a permit. Um, herbicide treatments are, are another story and permitting would need to be explored. Zone E is surface skimming. So this is one of the benefits of having a harvesting program is that a harvester um, can be used without its, um, its cutting blades to um, collect accumulated free floating plants and algae. And so all of that um, filamentous algae nuisance, you know, when it's really bad, the harvester can go in and actually scoop that, a lot of that up and remove it. Um, to reduce that nuisance. So in the plan, you know, these are laid out and described in further detail um, with, you know, additional explanations as to the considerations for each zone. Um, and that's kind of, you know, this, this table here is an example of that. I do want to highlight that we are recommending an integrated pest management approach and not a targeted AIS control approach. Um, 
and it, it seems similar, but they're different in what your what what you do and what your end goal is. So if you were to take a targeted AIS control approach of curly leaf pondweed, for example, you would be applying chemical applications um, early season every single year for seven to ten years um, with the treatments and monitoring to try to get on top of or control the curly leaf pondweed. And that control would not be associated um, with the navigation. It would be associated with controlling the population. Where the approach that we're taking is, you know, tackling nuisance plant growth, prioritizing areas that have invasive species for nuisance management um, with the end goal of improving navigation and recreation. So then we have the management programs. And basically the management programs are a way to um, kind of split out the funding strategy for each uh, approach or each program, as well as you know how, but it's primarily, I guess, associated with the funding strategy. So for instance, the primary navigation program would be sponsored by the Lake Association, and that would include the, na the primary navigation lane and the surface skimming of filamentous algae. The secondary navigation program would either be association, association, I can't say the word now, sponsored or paid for by shoreline property owners or potentially a combination of the two. Um, the riparian program would be um, funded by individual property owners who sign up for a particular service being offered by the association. Um, and they, they pay for the full cost of that surface, that service, or at least their portion of the service. Um, and then the protection and restoration program would be um, funded with, you know, grant dollars um, or things would be done through like volunteer networks and stuff like that. So that's just providing kind of a structure for managing the different, um, managing implementation of the different types of um, management techniques in the different zones. So with all that in mind, um, we recommend option one, which starts small and has harvesting beginning in year two. And so um, basically what that looks like is in year one, um, the primary navigation lanes, which the, you know, the map of what that would look like in year one is shown up here, would be treated with herbicides only in the worst areas and on a small scale. Um, the lanes would only be 30 feet wide and would primarily be focused in front of Edgewood Lane. This would allow, um, well, this would provide some relief in these really high density areas for navigation while keeping costs relatively low. And then giving the property owners time to pursue harvesting and decide if either contract harvesting is the way to go um, or if the group wants to look at purchasing and maintaining through an association um, their own equipment. With this approach, it's really important to know that the DNR, while they may permit this first year to give the association time to look into other options, um, it is highly, highly unlikely that they would permit herbicide treatments in subsequent years for these primary navigation lanes. Um, and the, you know, that's, the, the DNR is coming out with, is developing kind of new guidance and they're modifying some regulations and this would be consistent with what we can, what we're anticipating um, to come out in the near future, as well as kind of what we've been told um, when we're exploring some of these different options. The secondary lanes would be um, treated with herbicides to provide nuisance relief. 
Um, these lanes are shown in orange and should not exceed 30 feet in width. And then the riparian access would be um, hand removal by property owners or volunteers. And we're not feasible for a property owner to do that. Um, an alternative would be spot herbicide treatments. And so in the plan for each one of these options, you know, I listed out a very rough estimate of, you know, what might be some anticipated costs associated with the acreage that's mapped um, and kind of what I was able to gather from um, information available out there or from contractors. Um, so something to note is that, you know, this, these estimates that are listed um, is really for one time per year, and that's in spring management. But most likely, given the, the growth and the types of plants and things that are, are coming up, um, treatment would be needed twice per year. And again, this is very, very rough, um, but just to help try to put things into perspective and give, give the property owners something to compare across different option scenarios that were laid out. Um, in year two, this is where harvesting would start. And um, so the estimates and things are, are reflected in that. And then year three scales up to include, you know, more management areas with some additional management techniques. And so in here we have you know, some paid removal by a contractor. Um, and we've added in some of that surface skimming and stuff just to provide an example of what that kind of scaling up would look like over the years and as um, additional interest grows from other property owners. And then here's just all of it together. So um, we are running, you know, short on time, and I apologize for that. It's just it's a big plan with a lot of material. Um, so even skimming the surface on a lot of this stuff, you know, is is time consuming. But I I think that this action plan warrants some discussion and the way we have it set up. So I'm hoping that um, we can stop there for now and get some thoughts and questions from everyone. This is Terry. I'm just gonna um, make a comment on, um, I. I am definitely for the harvester idea. I just don't know how we can make something like that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that maybe there's somebody on the lake, maybe possibly that wants to start a business with a harvester. I have no idea. So I guess there's some talks that need to happen. And I don't know if anybody out there knows of any anybody, but I think definitely this bay could use a harvester because it's really bad. Yeah, and I know, I know, Terry, we've talked in the past where there's been some interest from some other areas in the lakes and a big target in the larger management plan for the system is to um, increase aquatic plant coverage. And so I think the demand for harvester is going to continue to grow. Um, getting in on you know the right now where and, and that's another reason why i wanted to build in that to give you guys another year to have these discussions and um although a year may not even a year is not even that long you know when you're talking about this type of money and um but that was kind of the, the whole point of saying okay well let's do the herbicide applications let's get you guys some relief um, and continue to have these conversations. Um, I, I have a couple ideas. I'm not quite ready to throw them up on here. And I, I think it's kind of post plan um, for the next steps and having those conversations. So um, I'll definitely connect with you, Terry. 
I, but I, I guess what I'm getting at is I do think there's options for working with okay. others in the system. Great. Great. That's it. Everybody else is on board with the plan. <laughs> All right. Sign your name. <laughs> Jack. I noticed that there, this is Brad. I noticed that there was um, a couple of bullet points there talking about a lake association. Um, I was wondering if, you know, how, how we could uh, get some interest in that. Yeah, so um, the lake association comes up kind of in that that next step. So what's left to go over is goal six and goal seven. And um, I know we're not going to make it through everything, but the lake association did have strong support in the survey. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to forming a lake association. Um, you know, it's it's voluntary. It's a lake association isn't you know, collecting any taxes, it's not a tax authority or anything. Um, but for, you know, this type of system and a lot of lakes that are addressing similar problems as Sunset Bay, that's the way that they go. And when you become an, an, a recognized lake association, you also become eligible to apply for those grants um, that are out there for, for different needs. Um, you know, instead of having to go through like an organization like us um, as a, a fiscal manager. Um, and the support, you know, also showed through in the willingness for people to pay annual dues. So those that said that they were supportive of a lake association, um, the majority of people said that they were willing to pay at least, you know, $50 up to $100. And some said, um, you know, over $100. Now, if you look at the numbers, it's it's 14, but this is a representative sample. Um, so I think that, you know, form, forming the association, you really need to have, um, you know, one or two people who are going to take the leadership to complete all the documentation, um, you know, su submit all that stuff, and then do the recruiting. Um, and, and pulling people in and then, um, creating kind of like your, your officers and stuff like that. Um, so it's a recommendation in here, the complete steps on the best ways to do it for Sunset Bay aren't necessarily outlined, but what I can do is help connect, um, people who are interested in, in kind of heading this up to with other groups that have formed an association um, to hear from them, like what worked, the lessons learned, you know, how did they get more property owners on board, that kind of thing. I will add, and I believe we've talked about this before too, um, that a lot of lake associations, if they are looking at a harvesting program, the way that they gain people in their association is by paying, you know, like you pay a set amount to have in front of your dock harvested or something like that. And then those are your association fees and things like that. Yeah, yep. And then that's where that the programs come in because maybe their dues go to pay for that harvesting, but then if they want herbicide treatments, they're, they pay additional set of fees that go into a pooled account so that people are kind of, the, the full cost of herbicide treatments is kind of shared. And so the burden is less for individual property owners. Um, Sally asked a question about, are these estimates per property owner? And that's a really great question. And no, these are, are not per property owner. Um, these are kind of estimates of, you know, saying that if you were to do all of this management, so an estimate of like the riparian herbicide application, um, if approximately two acres of riparian area were to be treated um, in year one, it would cost a total of $1,500. 
if all of those property owners were to pool together, apply for one permit and hire one contractor to complete those applications at the same time. And that's where that, again, that goes back to the benefit of having an association who can um, handle the kind of some of that coordination um, in financial aspect of that. I have another question. Oops. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, does anyone in in the Edgewood Lane area do you remember what was the herbicide treatment that we did a couple of years ago that was um, used twice in one summer season? Um, just wondering if anyone remembered what, how that worked or didn't work. Hi, this is Todd Cummings. Um, I remember them treating the bay once and what we paid for it one time. I don't remember a second treatment, but um, I know the DNR said that that was the final final without more of a active plan. So um, we sort of stopped at that. And the uh, there were varying levels of acceptance. Some of the neighbors, us included thought it was great it was immediate positive benefit and some of the other neighbors uh thought that they didn't get enough bang for their buck and wouldn't have done it again so it, it was a mixed bag with the people mm -hmm. that were involved in it and uh you know i think that's going to be the problem going forward now is you know you have some people that are very anxious to contribute and others uh have some really high expectations for their money and I I think that's going to be an issue for us. That is a very big issue for most like groups that do herbicide treatments. Um, you know, wind direction, water movement, all of that can move herbicides around and they're not going to stay in place. Um, so yes, that is 100% a common thing um, that a lot of lake groups deal with. I remember we were very excited about it, but we, in front of our property, we didn't see a lot of positive impact, but was worth a try. We're active rakers, and even with raking, um, you know, my goal is to spend an hour a week on the dock raking with a, a device called a tea weeder, and uh, mm -hmm. an hour a week is manageable but if you let it go a second week you know two weeks it becomes quite a job and three weeks it's out of control so uh, you got to really look at that realistically where it really takes a commitment and also what do you do to you know we're composting underneath our cedar trees but it's smelly and uh you know it's it's a lot of work putting it in a wheelbarrow and you know wheel milling and, and dropping it around the the property, but um, you know it, it works. But you, you really have to have a high level of commitment. Um, so, Emily, I didn't quite hear everything you said because I had a, a toddler running crazy behind me. Um, so I, I know the life. <laughs> but I one thing I did want to mention is that there are are kind of different. Um, there are some very reputable contractors in our system and some, some that are not so reputable. And while any herbicide treatment is subject to changes in environmental conditions, um, I do know from what I've heard from different people in different areas that the, the contractor can really make a difference. And um, so that that's something to, to keep in mind too and we do have some information that we can share on um you know how how to make sure you're choosing a reputable contractor over 
um, someone who's just kind of throwing chemicals at the problem for you know lack of a better way to say it. Um, and I don't know if that's what happened in the situation that you guys are talking about. Um, it just reminded me of of other conversations I've had with um, property owners in other areas. Um, the other thing to go along with what you were saying, Todd, is the with the peer pickup program. So this was really kind of um, based on Todd's idea, because I know Todd, you're out there, you know, raking a lot and stuff, and that's something that you that you've brought up. And with a harvesting program, you know, having um, a contractor that's out there, if you do have a contractor or whoever's out there that has is disposing of aquatic plant material um, this can be really viable or if you have a contractor who's out there doing um, sometimes some of the herbicide contractors will pick up the the um, the clippings and stuff so basically property owners would rake their area they have a designated kind of pickup time where they, they put the material at the end of the dock and um, a barge or a boat comes by and picks that up and then disposes disposes of it because um, the disposal of all that aquatic plant material can be quite burdensome. I don't have the logistics of exactly how that would work, Todd, but um, with Sunset Bay, it really depends on the approach that the bay goes with. But it's in there as a recommendation um, to say, like, hey, you know, as all these things are being considered, um, make sure that this this type of opportunity is being included. It may be a good uh, I, way to get an in with farmers for partnerships too, be, depending on the amount of plant mass, because they can use it on their fields also in the similar composting way. Right. I'm guessing, I'm trying to think, um, if you got two treatments in a year, I believe they used to do some small 2,4-D bumps on lakes where they would do two a year, but that's not really, I guess, kosher maybe is the word I want anymore. Um, herbicides are constantly changing and getting upgraded. Um, so the rules are also changing with them. I've been trying to find it while we've been talking. In my discussions with the DNR, they want a long-term plan. They're, the era of hiring a contractor and making a couple of applications is is over where they, they want a long-term management plan. Yep. And this this plan will yep. fulfill that, that requirement. Um, and my goal was to, at the same time, give Sunset Bay the flexibility in the plan to say, okay, we know this is our, our overall approach, but here's how it's gonna specifically work for us based on the property owners that are interested in um, having the management and the, the cost and things associated. So this is under preliminary review by the DNR currently, and um, the once we have the comments and feedback from everyone, and we've revised this plan to have the final version. Um, my goal in doing that was that when we submit that final plan, it will be a, a much quicker turnaround from the DNR, um, just being able to highlight the changes that were made. So this this will go to DNR and get approval um, this year. So I know um, I know we're past time. Um, so if anyone needs to take off, I completely understand. If anyone wants to stick around and you know have any other has any other questions or want to bring anything up for discussion, um, please feel free to do so. The things that we didn't cover were really some of the outreach stuff um, and the monitoring, evaluating, and revising the plan. Um, and then I just you know, want to make sure before anyone takes off to remind you all that the comment period closes February 7th. So 
you know, please make sure to give us, send us your feedback so that we can, um, you know, consider what everyone, how everyone's feeling about things. Um, feel free to contact me or Emily with any questions. Um, or if you want to walk through anything, you know, we're more than happy to do that too. Okay, it's me again, Sally. <laughs> um, so when we brought up, bought our property on Edgewood Lane in 2008, I thought it was super cool that the bay was so quiet in terms of, you know, waves, very, very calm, great for kayaking and all that. But it's that lack of water movement that really contributes to our problem, right? Some of it, yeah. Yep. So if you kind of cut or somehow treated like that traffic lane away from our shoreline, I'm, I'm going back about 15 slides <laughs> to remember, but that would be, that was one of your recommendations, right? Yeah. So to, let me pull up the full, sorry, Sally. It's okay. I was just trying to understand, make sure I understood the concept. So like here's here's our, our management reference map. And so it's basically all of the lanes. So if, if Sunset Bay were to 100% implement everything that's listed as a, as a possibility in this plan, this is kind of what that map would look like. Um, and really this is just future proofing the plan. So like a lot of these areas out here aren't needed. So that's why they don't show up in that option one, just to, just to make that, um, clarify that. But with, with these navigation lanes and with the navigation lanes getting, you know, consistent usage, um, you would have that, you would have increased flow and circulation. Is it gonna be 100% you know, perfect? Um, probably not, because it's going to be a uh, a learn as as you go type of situation. Um, it's also going to depend on how wide the navigation lanes are. And so, the primary navigation lanes harvested with um, maintained with a harvester can be up to 50 feet wide. Um, you know, but that takes more time, and so it would cost more money to have a navigation lane that's 50 feet wide versus one that's 40 feet wide. Um, mm -hmm. But if you had a 50 foot wide navigation lane and you had a, a you know a couple of ways, a couple of openings for that navigation lane, you would definitely be improving um, the ability for water to circulate. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And then you also have like the um, these surface skimming areas where you have all that filamentous algae that collects on the top of some of that vegetation. And as that kind of accumulates, you're also, you know, slowing down or limiting water flow. Um, and with that surface skimming of, you know, having a harvester that can clear out some of that, um, that would help as well. I, I wish that we would have had the budget to, um, you know, put in some, you know, different types of water movement meters and, you know, then we could have modeled out what water movement looks like and been a lot more precise with the location of these lanes or water circulation. Um, but because, you know, we didn't, we don't have that level of information because it would have been quite expensive to pull all of it together. Um, the navigation lanes are primarily based on the, the use and the location of the invasive species. Um, but it's an adaptive plan.
I guess, you know, overall, for those that are still on the phone, um, you know, if you've had a chance to read through or even just based on this presentation, is this is this what you were expecting or hoping for? Or, you know, are there things missing? Are there things that um, that you're concerned about? I think you did a good job, Corinne. <laughs> <laughs> you too, Emily. <laughs> now, this is scary. There's a lot of information here for everyone to digest. Um, I think it's a lot of good information, and I know it's everything that I'm sure the DNR needs to do the approval on the plan. So I think I think everything, you know, is appreciated. Um. Well, I, I can almost guarantee that you won't get denied a permit because you don't have the information available. Um, so that's a good thing. And I, I'm, when, you, when you go to apply for a permit, whether it's, it's a property owner applying or for the association or the contractor, um, it should be a lot of just, you know, kind of plug and play. Corinne, thank you. I think the plan makes a lot of sense for us as residents, but I, I think realistically, you know, this is very specific to Edgewood Lane. We probably have under 20, probably between 15 and 20 people that might possibly participate. And I think it would be, it's going to be a tough sell. Even for the first year is a tough sell. I wish it wasn't true, but I just don't see people uh, writing a check for four or $500 for one season and then knowing next year it's going to be significantly more. I think it's going to be a tough sell. Yeah, if, if there, you know, if there are ways that we can improve the the action plan, if there's things that, you know, we can do to reassess um, and make it more realistic based on what you guys are hearing from neighbors and stuff. I, you know, we very much welcome that. Um, I think, unfortunately, you know, we're, we get stuck between what, what property owners might be willing to do at this point and what the DNR is willing to permit. Um, and so we're, we're doing our best to try to find that that balance um but it can i think there's definitely room for refinement and you know that's where the feedback from you guys is going to be so important in the the next couple weeks here and i think that when someone writes a check for four hundred dollars and they aren't they don't have enough initiative to sit through this whole presentation and see what's going on they think for four hundred dollars they're going to be back out water skiing on the bay, and that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I do think though that at some point it, it it becomes their responsibility because the information is now there, um, and available. And I think that you know once, once the the bay or a group of property owners decide like this is the way we're going to go. Um, this information could be plugged into, you know, a simplified um, fact sheet of this is what we're doing, this is why, and, um, you know, here are the anticipated outcomes. Um, and again, you know, that those are things that we can help with down the road. Um, I've to, to numerous uh, neighbors that are questioning, you know, if this is worth it or if it's worth putting money into it. You and I have talked numerous times about property values with the situation that we have right now. We're, you know, for resale value, you're probably losing between 10 and 20% with the plant life that's living out in our bay. And uh, I think people need to see that, that 
you know, they're looking at a real short-term uh, issue with very long-term effects. So in the long term, it's in everyone's best interest to invest some money because everyone's got a lot of money invested in their properties. Good point. I, I, I think too that um, it's a, you guys are have a, a little bit of a harder time with this because you know on other lakes it's just an accepted fact that if you're a shoreline property owner you are going to invest a certain amount of money for maintenance or for management of the lake um, and that you know you have a membership in the lake association to do that and whether you need the harvesting or not in a roundabout way everyone around that lake is benefiting um, you know and this association does what they can to make it as as equitable as possible where you know someone who lives on the other side of the lake isn't paying for someone treating her on their dock um, but you know for example like Lake Nakabe, Shano Lake all of the, I mean there's so many lakes that the association is is paying for this management um, by management dues um, and one of the benefits of being part of the association and paying the dues is having a say in how things are being managed. And so I, that's, a, that's a tough sell for Sunset Bay because you're part of such a big lake. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how to overcome that. This is Brad. I can attest that we've got just in, in, a, in our close area here in Edgewood, there's three properties and nobody nobody's selling their house at all. And a lot of it has to do with the, with these weeds. Right. I mean, somebody said it was like 20%. It could be even more. You know, yeah, that's and, also not uncommon. What? I said that's also not uncommon. There's a lake up in, I don't know if it's Vilas or Oneida, one of those, where they have a bay that's just, it's choked out with milfoil and they can't sell their houses. And they're they're also unwilling to do treatments because of how nice the rest of their lake is. So, you know, where if you if you're trying to sell a lake property and you have an active association and there's a plan in place that says this is what we do, this is how much it costs. The people who are buying the property have more confidence that they're not going to be choked out and unable to use. The property the way they want to um but you know you guys are at the kind of the beginning of, of pulling a lot of this together so it's um it's really tricky i wish i had the the magic ticket i do know that um well i have a very strong confidence that the demand is going to increase um in the coming years and that people will be grateful if a lake association does exist, but they may not see that now. It might be five years down the road. Um, and that's unfortunate. I wish I had a crystal ball. I know somebody that was on one of these calls had said that they, that they would be uh, interested in, in starting it so I, I'm not I don't remember who that was Jim yeah we'll, we'll touch base with them well, we have the same problem every year where at this time of year when you start talking to the neighbors or in the spring when there's no plant life out there and you tell them that we have to start doing something and they look outside their door, they don't see anything. They think, well, maybe next this year won't be as bad. Well, fast forward till the end of June and they're coming back to you and going, oh my God, we have to do something. By that time, it's too late. And so it's it's really hard to get across to people the urgency of planning ahead because things aren't going to change. It's, it's always gonna be like it is. It's not gonna be like it was 20 years ago where they're their kids were swimming off the dock and they were water skiing in the bay. Those days are over. I, I also think those days were, 
you know, just looking at the history in, of the Bay and stuff, I also think those days were kind of a temporary blip um, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the life of Sunset Bay. Just knowing that it used to be land and it transitioned to, you know, emergent water and um, looking at the quality of aquatic plants and stuff are there. Um, I, I think that's a, an expectation that definitely needs to be managed because I, I just don't see that happening if the lake is working towards, you know, being healthy again. And maybe that's an unpopular opinion, but I also think that it's a lake with over, you know, almost 9,000 acres that there's a lot of room to water ski um, without having to try to pay for, you know, a path through the, you know, constantly fighting the vegetation um, for that type of use. Yeah, we're just fighting the vegetation to get out there. Right. Yeah, I think that's kind of the thing that we have to be. Yeah. yeah, we we we've, we've had trouble this past summer getting in and out of our boat lift. Yeah. No, I I was talking more of you know opening up that that back area um, to have you know being able to do like a water ski loop and stuff. I think that that's kind of beyond what's realistic. What you guys are are dealing with just being able to get out of your off your property um correct to the lake is different and you know maybe this this first year is you know the the property owners who are willing to be part of it um and put money you know into the the management maybe this map needs to be drawn to reflect that my only concern is if you submit a treatment map to the DNR that only has the secondary navigation and the riparian area, um, they may not approve it because there's there's no path drawn through the dense vegetation that gets you from that point out to open water. Um, but we can, you know, I'm I'm definitely open to thinking about these maps and making adjustments. Yeah, it should probably include something that makes makes sure that we get out to the open water. Yeah, so like like these lanes here, um, this kind of gets you to that edge of where it's really bad. Um, but you know, there's still sometimes depending on what time of year it is, some, some density issues through here, but it was, it was drawn to this point to say like, okay, well, where can we save a little bit of money um, and at least do the really bad spots? It also helps to have, there's only so many people that really actively use their boats on, on uh, Edgewood Lane and if the boats that are going out frequently all use the same pathway, it really makes it a lot easier to maintain a, an open area to get out to the lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, Terry, Brad, and Todd, I mean, if, if there's a group of property owners that wants to um you know do a virtual kind of mapping session and we can look at some of this and i can make some adjustments live while we're talking um i'm definitely open to that you guys let me know Do you guys have any other um, last thoughts for now before we sign off?
No, ma'am. All right, so um, we'll go ahead and call it there. We'll have this meeting up um, in a couple of days and I'll send a, a link out to everyone letting them know it's available. And then we'll remind folks as we get closer to that February 7th date. Um, and again, if there are property owners who you know, want to get together to refine some of these um, these prescribed treatment maps and stuff, we can definitely do that so that we've got something that's most useful um, for implementation here, especially here in year one. So just keep us in the loop and we'll wait to hear from you all. All right, thanks so much, Corinne. Yeah, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good night. You too.